89%. That's why I'm having my calf. to my channel my name is marissa and you're watching life after the fontan today we're going to be discussing my experience with my upcoming cardiac catheterization procedure otherwise known as a cardiac cath from this point on that's what i'll be referring to it as because it's much easier to say Please remember to like my video, subscribe to my channel, and turn on the notification bell if you'd like to be one of the first to watch my upcoming videos. And feel free to comment down below any questions or any video recommendations for the future. I will definitely add it to my list. I'm not sure about anybody else, but I feel like for me, I have always had time frames, either months to years where my health is really at its baseline. I'm not having any new symptoms. I'm not having any worsened symptoms. And then on the flip side, I seem to experience weeks to months where things are not as they should be. We're really starting back in this summer, actually. So for a few months now, I feel like I have been on this track of diagnosis after diagnostic exam after test after appointment one after another month after month ER visit overnight hospital admissions it, it's been busy so let's talk about what has prompted this cardiac cath I was at my pre-admission testing appointment for my previous surgery, my gallbladder surgery, check out this link above to learn more about that experience, where I walked out of the elevator and walked to the check-in desk and felt like I was short of breath, otherwise known as dyspnea on exertion. Now, let me start by saying Fontans, otherwise known as single ventricles, do tend to have lower oxygenation a healthy individual would be expected to have anything greater than 94% up to 100%. Fontans generally run in the low 90s, but for me personally, I've always been 94 to 96 when checked at a doctor's office or at any type of appointment. So anyway, I check in for my appointment. I get brought back into a room. Again, I'm at a surgeon's office for gallbladder surgery the following day. And they take my pulse ox, which is kind of like, looks like this. It's the little clippy thing or the band-aid looking thing that they'll put on your finger to measure your oxygenation levels in your blood. Basically how much oxygen is in your red blood cells and it was 90. And I immediately knew that something was wrong. So while waiting in that office to see my surgeon, I immediately began calling my cardiology office. They recommended that I go to the emergency room. It was pretty convenient to be right across the street already, but I knew while walking over and struggling to breathe that I wouldn't be going home that night. I, I could just tell. The emergency room experience was frightening because when I got in and, and stated my chief complaint as shortness of breath or dyspnea on exertion, they immediately checked my vital signs and saw that my oxygen was even lower now at 88%. I was taken into the back and put on oxygen. I usually wait in the waiting room at said hospital for hours at a time. This was less than an hour. I was admitted under the observation service at the hospital and they ran a bunch of tests on me to try to figure out the cause. I had a CT scan of my chest, I had multiple x-rays, I had two separate echocardiograms, an EKG, I was on IV fluids, I was on oxygen, I was on a heart monitor. It was frightening because as a cardiac patient, and a cardiac nurse, I, I of course 
was thinking of the worst scenarios. They were able to rule out life-threatening diagnoses such as a blood clot in my lungs, fluid around my heart, COVID-19. But with that being said, we still didn't know a cause. So my gallbladder surgery for the following day was ultimately postponed as I was admitted to the hospital for that night. I came home from the hospital the following afternoon, still having low oxygen levels, but we were all under agreement that there wasn't much else they were going to do over a weekend for me and I was at greater risk staying in the hospital because of the ongoing pandemic. And I really was just laying in my hospital bed so I could do the same thing at home. So that's where we're at now. Um, it's been about a month since that hospital admission that I had and intermittently my oxygen levels are still low. Sometimes I can go outside and ride rollerblades or go for a walk and do things as I normally would. Other times I can't even take a shower without my oxygen levels going into the 80s. The lowest I have seen is 86%. When you think about it, it is about 10 points lower than my baseline. So yesterday I had a four hour visit at a children's hospital actually, the same one I work at where I will be having my procedure done. It's funny because I really preach about the importance of transitioning from a pediatric cardiologist to an adult congenital heart disease specialist. And I'm getting a cath at a children's hospital. However, the cardiac cath team at the children's hospital is much more familiar with congenital heart disease than at the adult hospital. If they were just going to be measuring pressures for me, it probably would be done at the adult hospital, but they are anticipating a possible intervention. We're just not entirely sure what yet. There are a few options. Let me explain actually what a cardiac cath is for those that don't know. Cardiac caths aren't only used in the congenital heart disease population. They're used across all ages for all different types of reasons. One of the most common reasons that somebody may have a cardiac cath done is for a possible heart attack. A lot of times one will have a cardiac cath to look at their coronary arteries uh, to determine if they need further open heart surgery. My cardiac cath will be a little bit different than that of somebody who is having it for a heart attack just because we're not concerned that I'm having a heart attack is the easiest way to explain it. So a cardiac cath is when they take a long catheter and they thread it through an either an artery or a vein, usually in your groin. It could also be your wrist or your neck. Thread it through that blood vessel into your heart. Once in your heart, they'll measure pressures, they'll look at your anatomy, and they'll decide where to go from there. They can do some pretty amazing things from a catheter intervention, such as stent placement. They can dilate arteries if needed. They can replace valves in a cardiac cath, so it's pretty, pretty awesome. The plan for me now is to be accessed through my groin, which I've had twice in the past before. At this time, we're hoping that I'll only have twilight sedation, so I should not have a breathing tube. However, if an intervention needs to be performed, I will have a breathing tube placed. There are specifically four things that they're going to be looking for in my cath. I'm not going to get into explaining all four. Instead, I'll basically explain what they find afterwards. The recovery for a cath is pretty simple. The most bothersome part really is that you generally have to lay flat for six hours after the cath if they've accessed an artery, which is what I'll have to do. So I guess I'll be bringing a book. All right, so today is Saturday. My cath is on Monday. I'll try to add in some videos from my hospital experience and then I'll update everybody afterwards. Hi everyone, it's Kath Day. Um, it's like 5.30, we're getting ready to head to the hospital now.
gonna be great. <laughs> I have a YouTube page called Life After Fontan. So I have to record things for my followers. Awesome. Oh. So what's going on right now? <laughs> what's so funny? I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like lightheaded? No. Just feel happy? John Pazome gets drunk off of one white claw. That's great. That's correct. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll sign off for now. Everybody, I'm finished with my cardiac cath. I have to lay flat for a total of four hours. They only access the vein instead of an artery, so I have about an hour and a half to go. I'll update more in some following clips. My four hour flat time is finished. I have one more dose of IV antibiotics to receive, and then I should be headed home tonight, which is great news. Now been a few days since my cath and I feel like I don't have too much to update on but I still wanted to talk about the process itself, the findings and my recovery period and unfortunately some complications I've been experiencing since my cath. So as you saw on that previous clip, I went into the hospital that morning, I um, was put into a room, I got changed into a gown, had an IV placed, all of the usual things, answered a bunch of questions. I waited about two hours before being taken back to my cath. I actually had to sign some extra consent forms in the morning for a pulmonary procedure, which I did not end up having, and for general anesthesia. I was given that oral form of a pre-medication, a relaxation medication, otherwise known as 10 milligrams of Valium. I probably would have been good with two milligrams, to be totally honest, just because I don't remember a lot of stuff that happened at least half an hour following taking that pill. Um, it definitely did the job at keeping me calm. Everything was so, so, so funny. It's raining and the power went out? <laughs> Where's was this? Oh, Why is that funny? So I was taken back to the cath lab. I do remember being positioned on the table and having everyone come in and prepping per for the procedure. They gave me some medication through my IV to help me fall asleep. However, I was awake for a very good portion of my cath and it wasn't until the end of my procedure that they decided to bring anesthesia in to sedate me with stronger medications. I remember looking up over to the side and seeing the screen where you can actually see what they're doing in the cath, the, the images of the heart. So that was really cool, but also it was really scary just because I was asleep but awake, but it, it's, it's a weird feeling for anybody that's been through something like that, one would probably understand. For my cath, they accessed the, one of the larger veins in my right groin and not an artery. So I actually only had to lay flat for four hours after my cath and I was asleep for the first two hours or so. So it went by really, really quick. Um, by the end of the four hour mark, I was getting pretty antsy to be able to move and get ready to go home, but it wasn't too bad. So the cath report is great, honestly. My numbers looked really great. My pressures, my uh, oxygen saturations within the cath itself. The structure of my heart looks really good as well. The interventional cardiologist that did my cath was continuously using words such as amazing, awesome, one of the best Fontans that he's cathed before and he's cathed a lot, I'm sure. Um, so that was really reassuring, I suppose. They did have to coil a small collateral vessel. Um, so collateral vessels are one of the four things that they were looking out for when they went in to do the cath. 
They are small vessels that kind of build themselves in areas that they're not supposed to be for different reasons, such as blockages or pressure issues or things like that. So I have a few collateral vessels that are connecting my pulmonary artery to my pulmonary veins. So basically the blood that's supposed to be going to my lungs, well, some of it's traveling through these little veins or vessels and it's not going to my lungs to pick up oxygen. And then it's going to my body without oxygen. I was able to go home that night um, while the results were really awesome and that one vessel wasn't anything to be surprised about, I would say that the cath report was still bittersweet just because it doesn't give us an answer to the lower oxygenation and the dyspnea on exertion I've been having. Sure, a bunch of collateral vessels could cause something like that, but my burden of these vessels isn't nearly large enough to cause my symptoms. What's causing my symptoms? Um, I have a whole list of further testings that we'll have to do now, more specialists to see, to try to figure out why my oxygen's going so low with such minimal exertion. Recovery for the cath was not bad at all. Because they used such minimal sedation, I didn't really have any symptoms or side effects, I should say, from the anesthesia. My site where they did access me for the cath is not painful whatsoever. I had a pressure dressing on it for 24 hours just to make sure it closed up well. And I remember from my last cath, my groin being sensitive where they accessed me, but that may have been because it was through an artery that time. But for this one, I have no pain there whatsoever. My cath was on Monday, on Wednesday evening. I started having a new sensation where whenever I would take a breath in on inspiration, um, I felt like I had some chest tightness, kind of like at the upper part of my chest right here. And um, it was a very worrisome symptom. And I woke up the following morning and it wasn't just that chest tightness, it was pain and tightness on inspiration, on palpation, so when you touch it, on movement on my upper chest, my lower chest over my rib cage, and all throughout both sides of my back. It was very concerning because I've never experienced anything like that before. Thankfully, I was actually set to see my cardiologist that day who diagnosed me with something called costochondritis. This is basically just inflammation of where the ribs connect to your sternum and the cartilage in between and the muscles around it. And it can last for weeks and be very difficult to treat, apparently. Doing some pretty high doses of Motrin or Advil um, with my cardiologist's recommendations. So what next? Where do I go from here? Um, I was really hopeful that we would have an answer following my cath. Not that it's some big surgery, but it's definitely another invasive procedure and it really didn't give us the answers that we were looking for, which that's, that's the tough part of it. Though I should be very happy to have received such a good cath report. Next, we're going to be looking into some possible abnormal heart rhythms that could be causing this. And I'm actually being referred to a pulmonologist, an allergist slash immunologist, and I'll be having an exercise stress test with some pulmonary function testing. I'm kind of ready to get back to feeling good and go back to work. And really what we're hoping for is just to find a cause to these lower oxygen saturations sooner rather than later. Um, enjoy your holiday season and stay safe.